someone who came to Christ through a Gideon Clay scripture. Uh, our testimony this evening is a distinguished gentleman, John Parkinson, from Petersburg, New York, where he resides with his wife, Virginia, who's called Ginny, a couple who've been married for 57 years. And John is a farmer, and he joined the ministry, the Gideons, 35 years ago. And to set the stage for his testimony, John served eight and a half years in the Marine Corps, participating in the Korean War, from September of 1950 until October of 1951. He was injured in battle. He received two Purple Hearts. Additionally, he was awarded the Bronze Star for Valor and the Silver Star. Would you please welcome John Parkinson as our guest. John. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. I share my testimony tonight. I have to go back quite a few years, over 60 years ago. I was just a young fellow living on a farm in Schoharie County, New York. The war was still on, and I wanted to find out what it was all about. I remember I hitchhiked to Oneonta, New York, to see about going into service. Well, that day I ended up enlisting in the United States Marine Corps, and I had no conceivable idea where I was going to go or what was going to happen. They gave us orders that day to report back the next morning for transportation to Paris Island, South Carolina. And uh, we all got up in the morning, we, we met on the platform, and as each uh, would-be Marine walked down that platform, there was a well-dressed gentleman at the end of the train handing out gifts. Where I was, I couldn't see what it was. Come my turn, you get on a train. This gentleman handed me what I now know as a Gideon Serviceman's Testament. He wished me luck and told me how to use it. And I looked at him and I laughed at him. I said, what do I need this for? I'm going into the Marine Corps, I don't need this. I put it away, I forgot about it. <clears throat> Time went on, we were shipped out to Okinawa, and the war had just ended when we got there, so we didn't see too much action in Okinawa. Right after that, they sent us up to China for three and a half years. Part of my job there was to get our POWs back home, and it was garrison duty in China for three years. And then as we left China, we went back on board ship to come back to the States. And there's about 3,000 of us on there, and there was one, one young fellow by the name of Charles C. Klein. He was a lot different than the rest of us Marines. He was a chaplain's right-hand man. He was his aide. Every chance Charlie had, he tried to witness to us and tell us how to use these testaments, and God would answer your prayer if he'd only ask for it. Nobody paid attention to Charlie. We always pushed him aside and laughed at him. Charlie never got mad. His last words always were, God loves you, and so do I. Charlie would disappear on that ship. As time went on, I came back to the States and went back to the farm, and I looked around, and I said, gosh, there's nothing here. I've been gone for almost four years, and I re-enlisted in the Corps again. <clears throat> and as time went by at different duty stations, I found myself on board ship in the Mediterranean Sea. And there was a lot of Marines on that ship, and Charlie Klein was on the same ship. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't figure out why Charlie stayed <clears throat> in the service, but he did. He was still witnessing, telling us what to do, and where the hem sinks were, and everybody pushed him aside. Well, we... Finally got our orders, we were going into Incheon because North Korea had invaded South Korea. So when we got to Incheon, we made our landing on the mud flats there, and of course the maps we had didn't show up any seawalls that were there. We had old Japanese maps. And the only way we could get over this wall was about 24 foot high. We had to form a human chain, one man over the other, climb over the wall, and about every third man would go down. And you'd look back, and it wasn't you, you keep going, you keep going. We worked our way through Incheon, Hapskam City, Yojongbu, Seoul. We captured Seoul and we had the North Korean army completely on the run. Things were going good. Some of us Marines have been together since China, so we knew each other's moves every day. We knew what to do and when to do it. Just north of Seoul, there was word sent out there was... Charlie Klein came up to us and said there was going to be a prayer service for the honor of our dead and wounded. And I said, Charlie, I ain't not going to go to that. I said, that's, that's, your, that's your thing, not me. So I pushed Charlie aside, and he just smiled and went on his way. Shortly after Charlie left, the gunny sergeant come along. He said he needs men to go back to Incheon Harbor to unload ammunition for our drive north. 
And I thought about all that ammunition and that, that prayer service. Gee, I'm going to go with that prayer service. I'll get out of that detail. So I went to that prayer service. I got nothing out of it because I wasn't interested. Just a way of getting out of a job. Shortly after that, we worked our way north. We made another landing in Wonsan, North Korea. And now we were way up in North Korea. We were well, well over the 38th parallel. And we'd gotten word that the Chinese had started to enter the war. We had caught some prisoners and sent them back to the rear, but intelligence wouldn't believe that the Chinese entered the war. Well, they certainly did enter. We had many a skirmish with them. And as things progressed, we were in a place called Yudamni, which is on the east side of the Chosen Reservoir, six and a half miles from the Yalu River. It was November 27th, and it's a night I can't forget. That night, the Chinese hid with everything they had. Artillery, small arms fire, rockets, grenades, hand-to-hand -hand combat. We were in a situation, kill or be killed. It was my birthday that night. It was also Charlie's birthday. We both had the same birthday. And as things progressively got worse, we were down to hardly any ammunition left. We picked up the Chinese weapons when they came through and used them on. We were using bayonets and trenching tools, belt buckles, even swinging at them with your helmet to hold them off. Things got progressively worse as the night wore on. They kept coming and they coming. I found out many years later that they came at us with 125,000 troops. And we were completely surrounded on top of that mountaintop at the Chosen Reservoir. There's a lot going on then. And you get a chance to do a lot of thinking. I thought about Charlie with his Bible reading and his scriptures and how to pray. I said, nah, you don't need it. Sometime in the early morning hours, Charlie come crawling down the line to where I was. He come up to me and he said, Red, now's the time to pray. God will answer your prayers. I said, Charlie, get out of here. I took him by the shoulder. I threw him down in the snow. I said, Charlie, get back up on the line. Get back up where you belong. We're going to get out. We're going to fight our way up. It's the only thing we knew. Charlie disappeared over into the dark in the snow. It was 42 below zero. We had snow up to our chest. We had frozen bodies, frozen feet, frozen hands. Everybody was frozen, the dead and the wounded. There was bodies as far as you could look and see around that roadblock that we were on. We still had a landline left back to the rear. And I got on it. I wanted to try to call in some artillery. It was amazing that the line was never broken. I called in and they asked us where they wanted it. I told them we needed it right on the middle of the road at the village. And they said, we can't, we got troops there. I said, that's right. Send it in. We called artillery in on our own positions to hold the cheeks off. And the bodies were flying all over the place. Everybody was going down to get wounded, killed. My squad leader, Bobby Devins, changed positions to help us get back to a secure place. He dropped us off into a ditch along the road. The water was up to our chest. We lay dead, 40 below zero in the water, holding off the last line of Chinese to come down. I got through a lot of thinking then. I thought about Charlie with his prayer, he'll answer. I kept saying, no, no, you don't need this, you don't, I kept hearing those words. I opened up my testament, I looked at the 23rd Psalm, I didn't even know what it was. And I read the fourth verse that stayed with me. Yea, that I walk through the shallow valley of death, and I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. I kept hearing those words, and I kept tearing them out of my ears. No, 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 we don't need it, we don't need it. Then they hit us again, this time it was the end of the line. Dog was just starting to come up. And I had my testament. And I opened it up. I read it. I started to pray. I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know where God was. If God was so great, why is this happening to us? I said, God, don't you let me die. Not here. No, I want to see the sun one more day. Don't let me die here, Lord. I stopped praying. And within seconds, I looked around. The enemy had pulled back. We were all alone on that valley floor. We went in there with 93 men. That morning, I had six men left. 
There were three of us and three badly wounded men. I prayed for one time in my life, and God answered in a mighty way. What we needed was air cover. We needed clear skies. And right after I prayed to God to let me have one more day, air cover came in, the supplies came in, and we worked our way back. We took our, our wounded and our dead, we dragged them across this valley floor for over four hours. We tied in what was known as Fox Company up on Tacom Pass. They challenged us when we came up, but we finally got in there and tied in with them, only to find out that they had been surrounded for two weeks before we got there. As time went on, we worked our way back to the sea. We fought and walked 78 miles back to the harbor at Hong Nam. Got back on board ship, and first thing I did, I looked up Chaplain John Craven. He was our battalion chaplain. I told Chaplain Craven how I prayed that night and how I opened up my testament, and I got the word of encouragement. It was through my Gideon Service's testament and Chaplain John Craven that I accepted Christ as my personal Savior. And I have the same testament today in the back page is signed, November 27, 1950, Udan Ni, North Korea, Sergeant John E. Parkinson. I've had this testament ever since. As time went on, <coughs> we went back into the career again, worked our way up. I got wounded the second time. This time it was a ticket back home. We were working with a tank platoon, and we came under fire, and the tank got a hit. I went <coughs> off the top of the turret, and landed on the ground. I was bleeding. I didn't know where I was hit. I couldn't move. Finally, I crawled back up on the tank, and I directed some fire to where the enemy was. And then when it was all settled and done, I couldn't get off the tank. They had to take me down. I come to find out, I blew up my left knee and my right hip. I lost my face. I lost all my teeth. I spent a lot of time in hospitals coming back home, and back to the farm. And boy, that farm looked great this time. <laughs> <laughs> We've been on it ever since. And Judy and I have been married 57 years. And I just thank the Lord for bringing me out of there. But I had this hang up when I come home. Why am I here? What can I do? Until I found out about a Gideon giving a testimony in church one day. I told my wife about it. I never shared with Jenny about what happened. That was something else. Of course, when you tell your wife something, she has to tell somebody else. <laughs> she told one of her friends in the Bible study, and her husband happened to be Jim Black, one of our area Gideons. And Jim got me to share my testimony, and it's been going on since 1976. <laughs> And I just know now why I was brought home. My mission to help win men and women, boys and girls, mm -hmm. the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I just thank that gentleman who gave me that testament many, many years ago and how it worked out. And in closing, a lot of people always ask me, what if it became with Charlie Klein? I pushed him aside that night in the snowbank. Never saw Charlie again until about 1987, 88. I was speaking at a pastor's banquet in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. <clears throat> and as I got up to speak, this young gentleman in the back room stood up and hollered, Hallelujah, we finally got him. We got him. <laughs> I asked Charlie what had happened that night. He got confused when he left us in the snow. It was 40 below zero. He crawled into a culvert only to find out he was going in the wrong directions. He was headed to the Chinese outpost. Charlie stayed in that culvert for four days and four nights until the enemy retreated. He followed our footsteps back all the way to Hong Nam Harbor. He was one of the last Marines to come out of the reservoir. Charlie's a 50-year member of the Marcus Hook Baptist Church, and he, until his time of death, he was still preaching and he carrying on. And God bless Charlie. Thank you. Mm -hmm.